specification, more or less similar. Uh, there's some updated information here, uh, other, other places. Uh, as Paul was saying, it's uh, fairly topical right at the moment. Seems like the entire world uh, wants to now have a mobile presence, sort of like uh, 10, 15 years back, everybody wanted to have a, a web presence. So this presents a large mobile opportunity. When I first started, I'll uh, call it researching uh, apps and how to test in the mobile space, uh, I, I looked at some games and things like that. And I, I loaded a game and it was pretty terrible. I think it stayed on my smartphone for, for all of uh, 10 minutes. And since then, uh, I've looked with the dawn of social media, I think that's one of the big changes uh, over traditional software when we start talking about mobile apps uh, is pretty much everybody uh, has access to the App Store and the App Store reviews and the star ratings. And people are very quick, uh, I've heard, uh, on mobile apps to delete them. Uh, particularly, an awful lot of them are uh, free if it doesn't uh, suit the user's needs or isn't user friendly. Uh, people are rather quick to, to delete it. Uh, you don't want to uh, go there if you're trying to get your app uh, seen. And even worse uh, is the postings on social media uh, about an app. Uh, several of the apps that I tested way back when uh, no longer are out there, which is kind of hard for me when I'm teaching it because they were nice apps to load because they were so buggy. Uh, the, the, the apps have either changed their names or the companies have gone, uh, and uh, the, the social media postings uh, can, be, can be rather rather brutal. So you know, I don't think you want to be a, a bad testing example uh, out there. Uh, that, that's our opportunity uh, in this, this space. And I get this question a fair amount of kind of what does it take to be a, a, a great mobile uh, tester? Uh, I'll answer that with, with three aspects and then we'll get into the presentation itself to maybe give you some ideas of some uh, approaches, some patterns that can be used to improve your mobile testing. And, and I think you, in mobile testing you want depth. Uh, we don't just want to test the requirements uh, and, and test the basic functionality. Uh, you you want to go into uh, other aspects uh, of the app that users may ultimately care about. Uh, I'm a big believer that we should be passionate about what we're doing. Uh, I've been testing uh, software for 35 years, uh, obviously going back uh, long before even the days of the of the PC the testers that I've had a lot of respect for really wanted to do a good job in testing and had passion about it. So I think that's a thing that uh, I can't teach you passion, but uh, I think you can work towards getting it. And then finally, uh, in the mobile space certainly, uh, and we've seen it in other things, but the mobile space now with particularly the dawning of uh, DevOps and uh, continuous deployment and continuous integration uh, is speed. So how can we speed up the testing process? Testing oftentimes gets looked as kind of uh, the, the anchor that slows down the fielding uh, of things. And uh, I, I think as testers, uh, we want some patterns to, to speed things up. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you some ideas on this. Uh, the question uh, is, at least for me, oftentimes, what is mobile? I think most of us immediately think uh, the smartphone uh, and uh, the, the devices uh, associated with uh, the, the smartphone, things like some of the, the tablets and those kinds of devices certainly fit in there. But uh, as time marches on here, we're seeing an expansion uh, of mobile. Uh, into the, the wearable space, uh, and now it's getting called uh, IoT. So as we expand the definition of mobile uh, and what it means to test these things, uh, I think it's important to, to have a fairly broad view of at least what I mean by mobile and what I talk about and write about 
certainly smartphones are, are in there and tablets and medical devices, but I, I think the wearable space is, and the IoT space is now coming in there. But I'll even ask you to think a little bit about the picture that just appeared there on the bottom, uh, which is an automobile, uh, a, a car. Uh, these are becoming, uh, at least in the newer models, uh, mobile platforms. You have Bluetooth connectivity, you have cellular connectivity, uh, you may have uh, an integrated uh, information entertainment system and uh, that we plug apps into. And so some of us may start thinking of this as, as part of our mobile space and we need to test. And I don't know if it shows up on everybody's screen there, but if you look real carefully at that car, uh, that's actually a test system. If you look very carefully, uh, you'll notice that the car uh, is in fact covered in drapes. Uh, and uh, this car is out driving around uh, a few months back in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, it is essentially a mobile test platform. They're covered in drapes uh, because the exact nature of the car uh, has not been released uh, by Detroit to, to the magazines or the public, but they have a problem in, in how to test uh, this, this mobile uh, app platform uh, of uh, needing to take it out into the field and do some field testing. So they cover it in drapes. And it's a fair question to ask yourself, uh, why the mountains of Colorado? Why is that a good test platform? Well, uh, the mountains of Colorado are very high. Uh, the roads are very rough. Uh, we have snow six months out of the year uh, and a bunch of things uh, like that that make the environment uh, for the testing of the mobile apps uh, a little bit more extreme than you might have if you were sitting in a, a nice uh, office somewhere testing your, your mobile app, uh, which you probably want to do that too, but ultimately uh, going out into the field can be one aspect of testing that uh, the mobile space maybe needs to think about a little bit more than say your traditional desktop uh, PC or even your laptop PC where you're usually sitting in a room or an office uh, somewhere. They, these devices, all of them can be out uh, in the real world subject to all the real world uh, environmental changes. So I'm advocating that we need better app testing. Uh, certainly, uh, testing of the requirements and the functions uh, are what I like to call necessary but not sufficient. Once upon a time I used to be a mathematician. When we were proving things we used to talk about that all, all the time that you had to show something, but just showing that one thing that wasn't sufficient. Certainly our old friend risk-based testing uh, extends into the mobile space that can help prioritize and speed our test activities up, but, but I think we need a little bit more uh, as, as testers. And that's why I became interested in the concept uh, of uh, what Dr. James Whitaker uh, calls uh, attacks. Uh, I'll define those in a, in a few minutes and uh, talk a little bit about those as some examples for you to think about. And, and I don't know, Paul, was there a survey you were going to run here? You still there? I'm here, John. Go ahead. Did you have a survey question? Um, well, I think I sent one in and may have got lost in the shuffling of, of people and things like that. So if you don't if you don't have it uh, ready, uh, we can just move on. There there was a survey question I sent in that was going to appear here, but we didn't get a chance to get that set up. I guess I'm afraid so, I don't ha I don't have that. But if if you want to give it to me real quick, I I could get it together. Otherwise, um, you'll uh, we'll we'll just we'll, we'll just uh, go ahead and and. Uh, it, it was kind of a, a question of uh, how many people in the audience are currently testing mobile apps and things like that. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and assume we've got a, a fairly uh, uh, large number that if they're new to testing mobile apps, they're real interested in things, and if they've been testing mobile apps for a while, um, they're still interested. So some of the mobile situations I've run into uh, of recent on projects uh, and this one's fading, the top one's fading away a little bit, but for, for a while uh, I was seeing 
uh, apps that were being put out, uh, I'll say largely or wholly untested. Uh, I interpreted that to mean that people management, uh, the, the producers were saying, time to markets, everything, let's get it out there. Uh, we saw that in the PC space and the, the web space that people were just rushing to get to market. Uh, certainly time to market is important, but uh, if you produce a product, uh, particularly with the tendency for uh, social media uh, that's really lousy, you won't last long. Uh, the DevOps uh, thinking of uh, how to deal with testing and bugs uh, is changing the landscape a little bit. Uh, I don't go into a lot of definition of DevOps here, but for, for me, it's the combination of development uh, and operations uh, together uh, where you get things into the field quickly and maybe uh, use a little bit of operations to help you in the testing. Uh, th that can be useful if you're capturing the right kind of uh, data and information. Uh, I'll talk about what I mean by that here in a moment. And uh, as I mentioned, we still need to think about requirements, but for me, uh, and a lot of the things that uh, I now look at, uh, requirements are just one pattern, one thing that I've got to do. Uh, and ultimately, and this is nothing new to anybody in testing, uh, is that we're constrained by cost, uh, uh, schedule, and, and the users, uh, the uses of the thing, uh, how the operations actually work. So uh, as I was thinking about this stuff uh, back many years, uh, and I know I'm kind of strange sometimes because uh, I did a lot of uh, I'll call it weekend and uh, late night research. Uh, I, I started looking for where the bugs were uh, in something that's known uh, as a ta taxonomy. Uh, that's now getting expanded into data analytics and big data analytics uh, where we're collecting things in some of the apps through DevOps. Uh, we're mining things out of social media to look at uh, how people are responding. Uh, and uh, I started doing this years and years back. Uh, it's expanded for me uh, over time uh, to uh, be kind of an, an activity uh, that uh, I spend a fair amount of time reading things uh, that come in on email, reading things that are posted out on the, uh, the, the web. Uh, there's a variety of information uh, available. And a taxonomy is a classification uh, system of uh, the, the data and organization into trends and information that may help us do testing better. I've been talking about this now for a fair number of years. It's in other books like Lee Copeland's uh, book on uh, test design. Uh, my experience in talking to an awful lot of testers and test organizations uh, is they don't do a lot of data analytics uh, in terms of their error databases and their error uh, logs where they're recording the things they're finding in testing. Uh, I don't find a lot of companies, uh, a few, but not a lot of companies uh, mining things out of the social media and things like that. And so my, my first word of advice to everybody in the mobile space uh, is start looking uh, to those data sources uh, your uh, error bug report system, uh, your uh, social media systems to see what is being said about your mobile app. Uh, you will start seeing noticeable trends when you, when you do that. And so the rest of this presentation is kind of based upon the taxonomy uh, that I've been building up now for probably five years uh, and maybe did some earlier versions, but uh, the one I've got now, uh, been around for about five years, uh, it, it covers the mobile space and covers the embedded space, and now I'm starting to branch into the uh, Internet of Things. And, and uh, what I'm showing here on this chart uh, is a very much uh, condensed uh, version uh, of a spreadsheet that I have and maintain uh, on uh, a, a taxonomy. I will say the real spreadsheet is much larger. Uh, I also, before I produced the spreadsheet, uh, did a mind mapping uh, analysis 
uh, of the, the data that I was getting in. And, and what you're seeing here, the first column over there in the left, which says super category, uh, these are patterns of errors uh, that I started finding repeatedly uh, in public literature uh, and data that been uh, put out in things like social media and uh, reports. Uh, on system failures and things like that. And so if you come down there partway on the page, uh, you will see something called time uh, dash long run usages. Uh, and, and, and that's a particular type uh, of uh, error that I find found happening over and over. Uh, and then what you see in the other columns, you see aerospace, medical systems, mobile systems, which this session is particularly about. Uh, and then general, which might include some other aspects of mobile and some other uh, systems. Uh, I will say there are other classifications, but this is what will fit on a chart. And then you see the numbers in there. You'll see uh, crossed on the long run uh, 4, 1, and 20. Uh, those are percentages. Uh, so the errors tended to cluster 20% of them under general uh, on long run uh, usages. What a long run problem is, uh, where you have to leave the system up and running for very long periods of time. Uh, an example might be uh, here just recently, uh, the FAA uh, issued a uh, airworthiness uh, note uh, on Boeing's uh, 777 aircraft, as I understand it. Uh, if you leave the 777 aircraft, uh, the avionics and the electronics, up and running for very, very long periods of time. Uh, as I recall, the number was something like uh, 180 days, uh, which typically they don't do. But if you did that with that uh, system, uh, the, the electronics, uh, the computers, and everything uh, would come down. Uh, now, Boeing has issued uh, some uh, things on how to get that so that doesn't happen. Uh, it's the kind of standard thing that a lot of us know on our computers is you turn the computer off for some period of time and then you turn the computers back on. But they'll also, uh, at some point, if they haven't done so already, uh, issue some changes to the software, I'm guessing, uh, that would fix that. So when you see a high percentage number like that in one of the columns, uh, even 1% uh, under long runs under mobile, uh, that says there were a significant number of errors that tended to cluster in that, um, in that particular problem space. And that then became uh, an indicator of an area that I would want to test. Uh, what Whitaker did and I've done uh, is we came up with this notion uh, of attacks to go after these things. Uh, and the question then kind of becomes, well, what, what's an attack? Well, my definition is it's a pattern uh, for testing uh, based upon common mo modes of failures uh, seen in the software over and over. Uh, for me, it's part of what I use uh, during exploratory testing. So it's not a script. Uh, it's not detailed uh, enough for that, uh, but it is a pattern. It's along the lines of the kind of patterns that we see uh, in software design, where the software design people now for reuse are talking about design patterns that can be used that you then have to customize and tailor to the specific language and system that you're using. Uh, a test pattern to me is very analogous uh, to that. Now some people will say, well, it's kind of a negative thing because you're trying to uh, find errors, but for me that's one of the things that I'm trying to do is besides show that the software works, I'm trying to flush out maybe some of these uh, common trends in, in errors uh, that I see. Now, uh, it is based upon the taxonomy. Uh, you'll see, I'll go through a few examples. Nobody's going to be able to probably apply every single attack pattern uh, to every mobile app out there. You still have to think through uh, what's important to you, uh, what's maybe a risk to you and your, your app. Uh, and how much uh, time, and you certainly have to take the pattern and then kind of modify it uh, for your particular system when you're doing exploratory testing, or you could use it for scripted testing, uh, I suppose, too. Uh, this is based upon what I observed uh, over 35 years, 
is that uh, an awful lot of testers uh, have this uh, ability to walk in and with just a little bit of test time find an error. Uh, they, they get accused of having some kind of magic fingers or something like that. And, and I noticed this in myself, I noticed this in a lot of the really good testers I worked with. Uh, what I came to decide uh, is that uh, the human brain is very good at detecting patterns and learning patterns, even when we don't know that we're doing it. And I think that's what these very skilled uh, exploratory testers and magic testers, uh, they're not really magic, but they, they appear to be able to find an error in just a small amount of time. And I believe it's because they have mental models uh, of these attack patterns stored in their brain. So I think Whitaker and myself became interested in maybe giving uh, other uh, testers uh, a little bit of head start for developing these, these mental models. So uh, Whitaker has uh, three books uh, out on the subject and kind of a fourth book on exploratory testing. Uh, he defines uh, attack patterns uh, for the basic PC software, uh, another set for uh, web software in, in a second book, and a third book on software security. And in looking through his uh, attacks, I realized a lot of his attacks muted. used uh, for uh, the mobile space and, and the IoT space. But then I realized, gee, there were some uh, patterns that I was seeing that I don't think he addressed. Uh, hence why uh, I put those uh, in, into a book, a different title than, than his, but a very similar style of book uh, to uh, what he did. Uh, and uh, built upon that, including mappings to the attacks that he did. Uh, I defined roughly about 33 attacks uh, in my book uh, with some sub attacks uh, underneath some, some of those. And in the rest of the session here, uh, I want to look through some of these uh, at a very high level, Reader's Digest version. Uh, I won't be able to give you the details uh, on that, uh, but I'll give you at least one of these patterns and, and kind of show some of the, the uh, attacks that I've defined. And interestingly enough, I actually asked uh, Dr. Whitaker about this. Uh, the data showed uh, that uh, as projects, and a lot of us are working on agile teams in the mobile space, uh, that an awful lot of the errors that were slipping through could be found uh, at what I like to call the developer level of testing. Uh, now, this might have to be done by somebody on the Agile team supporting the developer, uh, but the first set of attacks here, a lot of testers will go, well, that's the kind of thing the developer should do. But what the data showed is that while we've known about this for a long time, uh, we have tools to help us do these things. It's still not getting done by an awful lot of development teams, even those agile teams. So the first one uh, that I uh, recommend people think about uh, is static code analysis pattern, uh, which uses static code analysis tools. We do this during the coding activity. Uh, it can find a set of errors that are hard to find by, I'll call it traditional testing, uh, is what the data shows. Uh, but uh, developers a lot of time will shy away from this because of the problem what's known as false positives uh, in doing the static code analysis tool. And the static code analysis tool is sort of like a compiler on steroids. It comes back with a report of potential issues, but um, developers don't like it sometimes because about half the issues sometimes are not really problems, it's just indicators. Uh, here's where the test team can kind of step in and do an initial filtering uh, of the data coming out of the static code analysis tool and then give the nice, I'll call it filtered uh, issues back to the development folks to go get, get fixed. Uh, it removes uh, a certain percentage of errors, uh, which is the kind of thing that as testers I think we have to do is keep removing percentages of, of errors. The next one that the data showed uh, was on uh, the white box or structural uh, testing of the data uh, that's uh, contained in the software. Again, this would be the kind of thing the developers should do. Uh, in one report, I found the value of pi uh, being wrong uh, out, I think it was like seven or eight decimal digits. Uh, 
Uh, you can look that up in most books and online, but it was wrong uh, there. Uh, another example of problems that we were seeing uh, that developers tend to miss uh, is they'll often test uh, the data inside of their unit of code uh, with what I call nice data, uh, powers of two, uh, which computers work well with nicely. But uh, if you put in uh, something like uh, a third or a fifth and use that in the computation, all of a sudden uh, the, the, the numbers don't work out quite as nice. So we as testers can help uh, the developers, maybe in the Agile team, know how to select better data uh, with, with this attack. The third attack was also kind of a developer one. Uh, this is the classic one that most of us know about, which is testing the structures uh, of the code. Uh, the basic level is covering uh, what's known as covering statements, uh, that you have a test for each statement. You would think that that would be pretty obvious, but <clears throat> evidently a lot of programmers weren't uh, reaching statement coverage or branch or decision coverage, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, at a sufficient level to detect certain kinds of errors. It's pretty basic stuff, certainly, but as the test team, places I've worked, uh, we uh, found the same kind of data. Uh, we instituted uh, activities uh, in the Agile team, uh, helping the developers, uh, supplemented by the testers, to cover these areas a little bit better. Uh, our error rates dropped. Uh, we found more errors earlier. Uh, while we were still doing initial development and initial sprints, uh, and uh, I'll say everybody was happier uh, on things. So the next attack I want to at least uh, kind of talk about and mention a little bit uh, now moves out of uh, the developer world uh, more into the kind of world that Tevet testers traditionally function in. This one I called uh, finding hardware system unhandled uh, user cases. And a lot of people will say, well, we're doing software testing. Why do we care about the hardware and the system? Well, again, the taxonomy data showed uh, that an awful lot of times uh, the testing had not covered uh, essentially a use case or user story uh, that involved uh, the software running aspects of the system and the hardware. If you think about the mobile devices that we're uh, testing on, uh, they're, they're really fairly complex uh, hardware platforms. They have accelerometers, they have batteries, uh, they have uh, network communications, they have all these things that we're interfacing with uh, and uh, affecting uh, potentially how our app works. And if we don't test on the real hardware, if we don't look for these unhandled cases as part of the scenarios that we test, things slip through. And that's exactly what the data showed, uh, is that there were cases uh, that evidently nobody tested because uh, the error got out into the field. Uh, and the reason I know it was a software-related issue is the fix that the data showed uh, was to update the software. Uh, they had to issue software fixes and push new things on to the mobile devices uh, that were uh, out there in the field. Now, this presents an interesting problem when it comes to things like regression and things like that, uh, but uh, it really speaks to the fact that as testers, uh, at some point uh, in our, our testing of the mobile devices, uh, we probably need to go out in the field. And I've seen some interesting kind of sub-variations under this pattern. Uh, one set of folks I talked to talked about having the elevator test, uh, they called it, uh, which was they fired their uh, app up. It was a hybrid app, uh, and uh, they would start doing things with it, and they'd walk around in the office and go into the elevator. Uh, those of us that have taken mobile devices into the elevators know that an awful lot of elevators uh, have uh, an awful lot of metal and shielding, and the cell phone signals drop or degrade that may affect the performance uh, of there. So that's kind of a specialized little case uh, of this, this pattern. The next one I want to talk about uh, 
probably doesn't get thought a lot by, by many testers, uh, but some of our apps uh, have supporting documentation uh, and help files. They may be online, uh, they may be web-based. Uh, I've seen a few, uh, not many, that are uh, paper-based, uh, but they, they give instructions to the users. We've seen now in the taxonomy data where uh, that information, those instructions uh, to the user or instructions to the help desk people, uh, the support center, uh, were uh, wrong, and so the user got confused. Uh, this is part of the user experience. may not be directly the user interface or the graphic user interface, but it's overall part of the user experience. So this pattern talks to the fact uh, that if there is that kind of supporting information out there, the test team probably should pick it up uh, and use it just the way uh, a user would do it or a help support person uh, would use it. And if there's uh, an error in that information, it probably needs to be corrected. Now this probably won't be a software change, uh, it might be change to online documentation or on uh, information used by the service center, but uh, it's still, uh, in my book, an error that needs to get fixed. Uh, and so this pattern, actually a couple of patterns, 22 and 24, uh, talk, to, talk to that one. Uh, an interesting one that the, the data uh, showed uh, quite, quite a bit uh, is uh, finding missing or wrong alarms. Uh, an awful lot of us now uh, use these uh, mobile devices with calendars uh, and with uh, as alarm clocks. In fact, an awful lot of young people don't even wear uh, the old-fashioned kind of wrist, wrist watches anymore uh, because they get their time uh, and their alarms from their, their mobile device. Well, there have been a few fairly well-known uh, cases, one involving Apple, uh, going across uh, uh, the year boundary uh, where the alarms uh, got dropped and everybody that had alarms uh, the next Monday morning uh, were they were uh, missing the alarms or they were late. Uh, these are kind of classic uh, problems involving uh, the technique of boundary value analysis certainly, uh, but also involving uh, a larger pattern uh, of if your app is working with alarms and using uh, alarms and interacting with the operating system, uh, we probably want to test those things. Uh, we probably want to test them out in the field. Uh, we probably want to think about uh, how to test them across the various kinds of boundaries uh, that are out there. And you've got boundaries at hours, days, months, uh, years. Don't forget about things like uh, leap year. Uh, all those kinds of things uh, could produce. And again, uh, the data showed that there was a clustering uh, in, this, in this area. The next attack uh, was only partially in the book, uh, but since I uh, had the book published a couple years back, uh, realized that usability was still suffering. Uh, the book does talk some usability things and some things particularly in testing in the gaming industry. Uh, but this one I'll talk in a little more, more detail uh, as to the, the, the pattern of things. And, and so the, the, the book in its patterns talk about when to apply the attack. Uh, it talks about the kind of faults that make the attack uh, successful, a little bit out of the taxonomy. Uh, and an example there uh, in usability is the gaming industry is highly, highly competitive. Uh, depending upon the study you look at, 40 to 60 percent of downloads on mobile apps are some kind of, kind of game. Uh, they come and go rather quickly. And there's high user expectations for, for good usability. So uh, the who becomes an interesting problem. Certainly the development and the test team uh, can go through a whole set of uh, test activities for assessing usability. Uh, but then we get into questions of uh, what does the real user community do? And that takes us to the A-B kind of testing uh, where we might <clears throat> put the app out 
uh, or one version uh, out uh, to group A and then a slightly different version out to group B, uh, maybe in a crowd or a beta early release, uh, and then poll them, uh, do some surveys, talk to them. Uh, did they like uh, the user interface? Did they not like the user interface? What did they like? and not like about it. Now I know an awful lot of classic software testers will go, well, that's not the kind of testing I do. But as an overall integrated uh, system uh, kind of test activity, uh, when we start talking about usability, I, I think we should at least uh, make sure somebody is looking at these kinds of things because the user experience becomes paramount, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we certainly start thinking usability throughout the life cycle. Uh, A, B, me testing may have to wait till we've uh, got a, I'll say, a good beta version. Uh, but we're looking to find the unhappy users, uh, a user interface they really don't like. Uh, and we find those bugs and, and we can maybe go fix them. Um, the, the book and other folks uh, out there uh, tend to do this kind of testing with checklists so that we don't forget things. Uh, I won't have time to go into the detailed checklist in this session, but I'll, I'll mention it's a, it's a good thing to uh, have out there uh, on do it. Uh, the roles in usability testing. Uh, certainly the developer uh, should be the first uh, tester uh, in looking at the usability. Uh, the next person up would be the uh, app architect or the director. This would be somebody uh, on the team that's probably kind of the visionary for what the thing uh, looks like. Uh, and then a lot of teams will hand things off to another team member, uh, maybe during pair programming or maybe during uh, uh, reviews. Uh, the term I like, uh, which is in-company dog food uh, testers, uh, which comes from the idea if you know that you're going to have to consume the thing, uh, in this case dog food, you would probably make a really good steak, uh, which my dogs don't get uh, much of, but uh, if I were producing uh, that for them to eat and I knew I had to eat it, I'd make it the best uh, dog food I could, could have. Th then we go into handing things off to independent testers, maybe inside of the organization, maybe an outside third party, or as I mentioned, there's now the crowd source kind of, kind of testing, uh, then maybe into mass beta trials. Uh, I've been flying United Airlines uh, quite a bit recently. Uh, they're deploying uh, out uh, the Wi-Fi systems, uh, which play through the mobile apps that they have. Uh, what they're doing, my opinion here, uh, is kind of a mass beta trial, because it's all free right at the moment. Uh, I will tell you, I've found bugs in what they're doing and kind of sent that back to them in their, their surveys. Uh, and then finally, in usability testing, you might want to think about who you don't want testing these things. Uh, an example might be uh, my 85-year-old mother uh, who uh, has Parkinson's and really can't use uh, computers much anymore. Uh, probably not who you, you'd want to, to test, uh, say, a game. Um, but maybe something else you might be good testing for. And there's other roles uh, that you might want to ask yourself out there uh, that you, you could put in there, but this is a basic starting point. I mentioned these patterns. Uh, here is uh, one of the patterns, uh, Reader's Digest version uh, out of uh, what's out there. But uh, the, the pattern looks like this. Again, you'd have to modify it to be actually used in a real test. Uh, it starts out with uh, taking a checklist, which it presumes you have one of, uh, refining it to the particular scope uh, of the app that you're uh, testing, uh, then defining a role, one of those roles we just looked at, uh, or maybe another role, say like uh, playing a teenage uh, gamer. Uh, you then define uh, the usage uh, here with guided exploration of the system. Maybe next one down, uh, a stress and unusual cases would be included in there. Uh, you want to capture the understanding, the risks and observations as you go. Uh, now I get asked sometimes in mobile, how do you do that? Uh, one is with taking notes, certainly. 
but of recent uh, one case I was able to use one of the capture playback tools for the mobile app to kind of capture my exploratory session. I could then play it back when I found an error, show it to the developer and get it fixed. That was kind of cool. And then I threw the thing away. I uh, wasn't that interested in the playback side of things unless I found an error. Um, that's a way of capturing things. Uh, fill the checklist out as you go. Uh, then maybe down the road run some uh, AB exploratory attacks by somebody maybe in a crowdsource setting. You learn, uh, you replan and repeat uh, things. Uh, and that's the basic one of these patterns. Not enough to actually do a test, but a good starting point for it. So uh, I want to wrap up here in a little bit of time that I've got left. Uh, this area has become uh, a big, uh, both I'll call it industry concern, but it's been a personal pet cause of mine now for at least five years. Uh, and that's the notion of security and security attacks. Uh, I've had a few people reading or reviewing my book going, well, we thought this was all about security testing. Uh, I hope in the attacks I just showed you that you understand that the concept of attack patterns is more than just security. However, uh, for me, security is kind of the, the, the tall pole. Uh, it's increasing importance, particularly in the mobile app space. Uh, so if your mobile uh, app and mobile device uh, that you're uh, testing has things like account numbers, user IDs and passwords, or what's known as location tags, or is using some kind of restricted data uh, that it's uh, keeping around, even if it's just on a temporary file uh, that's kept inside of the system and not necessarily immediately visible to the user, I think you have to be thinking doing some of these security attacks. And uh, so that means if you're doing things with a server uh, and a registry-based password, location uh, tags are based upon uh, things that when you walk into a store, I've got several apps that I'm kind of evaluating. I walk into a store, it knows what store I'm walking into. Uh, it also knows and makes recommendations for other stores that I should go into. Um, that's a security and privacy issue, potentially. Uh, I'm okay with that, but then I don't put anything on my mobile devices uh, that's, I'll call it personal. I don't have any uh, restricted data, and if I do, I uh, immediately delete it off of there with some programs that I run. Uh, I don't do any kind of banking or any kind of those things. So if I ever lose my phone or it gets hacked, I really don't care, but I'm still pretty careful with that. And then finally, if you're doing any kind of profile-based uh, assessments, uh, for those of you that don't know what that is, uh, this is something that comes out of the banking industry, particularly credit cards, where they watch usage and usage patterns. And if they suddenly see that I'm in South Florida uh, and I've not told them about it, uh, I've had my credit cards locked up. Uh, because that's a hotbed for uh, hacking of credit cards and you have to notify the system that yes I really am in Brazil and it's okay turn the thing back on. Um, these are security things that if your app is running these I think you need to start thinking about these security attacks. Uh, now you may need to get some specialized tools and training I'll get a little bit more on that in a moment uh, I don't go into these attacks and details, and I will say that this is only scratching the surface uh, of attacks. Uh, I list about seven or eight there, the classic ones, things like penetration testing, uh, a couple of variations on that, and something called uh, uh, fuzz uh, testing. Uh, those are things that I think teams should be, be looking at doing. Teams might also want to be looking uh, at, I love the name, social engineering. Uh, can we social engineer uh, to hack into the system? Uh, and, and that's another one that I like to encourage teams to, to look at because this is what the bad guys are out doing to try and steal the data. Uh, it's possible to do spoofing attacks where we fool somebody into assuming somebody's identity. 
that includes not only spoofing identity, uh, but now on some mobile devices, they're very dependent upon GPS signals. Uh, GPS uh, has been spoofed. Uh, people should be aware of these things from a security standpoint. Uh, Whitaker, in his book on uh, security testing has another set of attacks which I map to and say these would be good attacks to do also. Uh, so there's a larger set that's out there. But between Whitaker's work and my work, I'll say I think we've only just scratched the surface. I don't even have an idea at the percentage. Uh, but it's the kind of thing where uh, I think testers need to be starting with these things as a starting point and then learning some other things in the security world. It's getting uh, nothing but a bigger and bigger problem uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, now I have to talk a little bit about uh, if you were to apply those attacks, if you go get Whitaker's book or my book, do not do it out in the public, please. Um, when we test these things, uh, on projects and things like that. We do it inside of a sandbox or secure area uh, where things don't go out into the public. Uh, it is illegal in many countries uh, to do these things. Uh, we just had one in the United States not too long ago, again, United Airlines, uh, where a passenger uh, hacked uh, a United Airlines uh, airplane was evidently uh, able to gain control of some aspect of the airplane uh, by going in through parts of the information system. Uh, it was a little more detailed than that. He actually had to uh, do some wiring to, and open some boxes uh, on board the airplane. Um, he got banned off of United Airlines. He may now be banned off of all airlines. I don't know. Um, he was uh, maybe not arrested, but talked to by the authorities. Um, don't do those kinds of things, please. Uh, I can tell you how to drive a car 100 miles an hour. It's real easy to get in, trump down the accelerator pedal, but in most countries you'll get a speeding ticket. So please don't tell people, John Hager said, go out and do these security attacks, except on the project inside of the sandbox. That's where I think we have to do. We'll skip the survey since uh, we didn't get those in. So kind of pulling this together uh, and getting off the stage here. Uh, I see these attack patterns, the ones Whitaker's got, others that have yet to be defined by other people uh, and myself as being the kind of thing that helps uh, in our exploratory testing uh, in the design and execution. It gives us a starting point pattern uh, to go do these things. You could use it in classical scripted testing too, don't get me wrong, uh, but these things have to be the starting point. For me, it's one of the pillars that I like to, to build on uh, in my testing uh, as, I, as I start it and then improve things. Uh, certainly, if you start looking at your own error data and your own data that's out there uh, in social media, you will find different uh, patterns in the errors. You will then think, have to think about different patterns uh, on attacks. I'm not saying these are all inclusive. Uh, so, you know, I think we have to expand this stuff uh, and think about it when we're building our uh, charters and strategies for, for testing. Uh, th that's how it plays into the exploratory uh, approach. Um, so I hope I gave you a little bit of uh, a starting point for the ideas of these, these patterns, uh, attacks, if you will. Uh, it, it is based upon uh, data. I continue collecting uh, the data. So uh, maybe a future version of the uh, book or some other things will have slightly different attacks uh, in it. I would fully expect if you analyzed your own data for it to look a little bit different in your local context. I encourage people to do that. It's an underused, uh, aspect of software testing that I think we could all do better. And even better, if you do that, I encourage you to publish that data. It's very hard to find that kind of information. Uh, one size doesn't fit all. These patterns have to be changed. Uh, and the ones that I reviewed here, I'm not saying those are the only ones to, to use. Uh, you still have to think and tailor this stuff. Um, last few things, uh, I just like to give credit. Uh, I get a lot of ideas from, I mentioned James Whitaker, but there's other people 
uh, James Bach, Kim Kaner, Gene Ann Harrison, Lee Copeland, a lot of folks uh, that give me great ideas uh, over the years. So I like to give reference and citations to those other folks and, and books out there. Um, and with that, Paul, I'm, I'm done and just uh, about five minutes to go here. Unmuted. Excellent timing, John. Thanks very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions for John, now would be um, a good time to type them into the control panel in front of you there. If you um, if you type in your questions, I'll uh, I'll ask the questions to John um, over the next over the next five minutes or so before we wrap up, and then any following conversations we'll um, we'll take over to our um, community portal over on Test Huddle. So. Um, just while we're waiting for questions to come in there, I'll just share a bit more um, information um, on the upcoming conference and um, other marketing materials that um, are coming up in the uh, in the near future. We have another webinar in about a month's time. It's uh, titled The Connect Between Augmented Reality and Software Testing. Um, and that's going to be presented by Nandan Shabra. That's on the back of a article that Nandan wrote for us on uh, augmented reality last year. It proved quite popular. So this, this webinar is going to follow up on that. And if you visit testhuddle.com forward slash content dash calendar, you'll see a full list of webinars up till the end of 2015. Um, and there are other resources there as well, like ebook releases and stuff like that. That would be uh, quite useful. Um, and of course, if you've got an area, an interest in the areas of mobile testing, um, Eurostar are hosting a new um, mobile testing conference, which takes place the day after Eurostar this year in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And for anyone that registers for Eurostar, uh, you'll be entitled to a 50% discount off uh, the registration for that. There are three excellent keynotes. I know Alan Page from Microsoft is in there, Julie Gardner. Um, a track sessions already um, already confirmed for that as well, and there are also mobile sessions at the Eurostar conference this year under the theme of Walking the Testing Talk. Uh, that conference is chaired by Rude Tennyson, um, and if you book before the end of June and use the discount code MWS15, just in the top corner there. Um, you'll be entitled to a 15% discount. That's exclusive to people who are attending these webinars this week. So um, just bear that in mind uh, if you're if you're planning on registering. Um, and that's it. If, if you're interested in posing any questions to John later, um, join the conversation on the discussion board and test huddle. I've shared the link in the uh, control panel there. So if you want to visit that, um, we can pose the questions to John afterwards. I don't really see any questions coming through at the moment there, John. So um, maybe we'll that's, leave it there and fine. follow up afterwards. Yep that's, yep, that's fine. I'll be in the test huddle after I get some breakfast. It's breakfast time for me here in the States. Uh, so well, of course, yes, yes, you're really a good day. I'm, I'm going to go get myself some lunch. You get your breakfast and enjoy it, and uh, maybe we'll see you over on the community platform afterwards. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Thanks very much, John, for your presentation. Thank you, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Cheers. Bye-bye.